My name is Karen Busby. I'm a professor of law at the University of Manitoba, and I'm also the director of the Center for Human Rights Research. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. Let me start by acknowledging that we're on Treaty 1 territory in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people and the homeland of the Métis. We are near the place where the Assiniboine and Red Rivers meet, a place where for thousands of years was a peaceful gathering place for the people of the nations living near the center of Turtle Island, the Cree, the Dakota, the Dene, the Oji Cree, and of course the Anishinaabe. I also want to take this moment to acknowledge some of the elders who are with us today, some of whom I've had the honor of working with over the last few years. I also want to acknowledge that Universities Canada is the sponsor of this event today through their Mindshare program. And finally, I want to acknowledge the pristine water that everyone in the room has enjoyed today, either to drink or to wash or to carry away waste, that it's come from the Anishinaabe people who live in Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Ironically, the engineering works built to supply the people in Winnipeg with the wa that water have contaminated the water supply in the First Nation. The Shoal Lake First Nation has lived under a drinking water advisory for 18 years. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you today's opening plenary speaker, the Honorable Frank Yakabuchi. If I were to stand here and deliver a standard introduction setting out the details and dates of even just the high points of his career, there would be no time left for his talk. So let me just say that the Honorable Frank Yakabuchi has been a corporate lawyer, a law professor, a law dean, a university vice president, a deputy minister of justice, and a judge. In 1991, he was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. He retired from that position in 2013. But the last 13 years can hardly be described as a retirement. Since that time, he has been an interim university president and a member of many corporate and not-for-profit boards. He has chaired various inquiries into allegations touching on serious human rights abuses, including police brutality and state torture. In one of these reports, Mr. Yakabuchi emphasized the need for establishing a government-to-government -government relationship between Canadian governments and First Nation governments that he said needed to incorporate an underlying respect for cultural, traditional, and historic values that are different. When we invited the Honorable Frank Yakabuchi to join us today in recognition of his role as the mediator who helped broker the deal leading to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, we were honored when he accepted our invitation. So please join me in welcoming to the podium the Honorable Frank Yakabuchi. Well, good morning. Thank you very much, Karen, for that uh, more than generous introduction. Um, well, I'm pleased to be here in the uh, land of, of the uh, Anishinaabe and others, the uh, homeland of the Métis and Treaty 1, and of course uh, with uh, uh, the sponsorship of uh, the University of Manitoba and the uh, University of Winnipeg, who couldn't be more qualified uh, to uh, sponsor and bring about this, uh, this gathering. Uh, I commend them, I commend the sponsors, uh, I commend uh, the uh, chiefs and elders and uh, our first people representatives uh, and participants. Uh, all, all these gatherings will take on increasing importance uh, for all who put, put Canada uh, or their uh, first people origin uh, as their birthright and birthplace. Uh, I see some old friends here. I see a former student that I taught. I don't know why he would come back for more punishment, <laughs> but uh, Bob Vernon, I, uh, I, I think it must be your faith that brings you here, not my speaking, uh, and, but that's great. And I see Stephen Cackfrey, who, uh, uh, who is the uh, imaginative mind behind some. Canadians for a new partnership. Uh, uh, he's here with his sidekick, Scott Serson, uh, an organization that really was, came, came about through uh, Stephen's imagination and what was going on in our country. And it led to a number of us being um, 
persuaded by him and, and, the, and, and the attraction of doing something uh, about uh, Canada and uh, the uh, relationship with indigenous people, which is the subject of my talk. It's, in fact, it's Canada and toward a better relationship, toward a, a new relationship uh, with First Peoples. Let me just say at the outset, I don't know if there's some water around here. If I could. Oh, thank, thanks, Karen. In my 55 years of the law, I've never encountered, and I've said this so many times, a, a more complex set of issues uh, than that which deal with, thank you very much, with uh, Canada and indigenous peoples. Having said that, I can also say the establishment of a new relationship between Canada and First Peoples is the most important societal issue facing our country. There's just nothing more important, in my view. One only has to look at a history or look at the economic and social and living conditions on many reserves, especially in remote areas, which are comparable to third world environments. Unemployment, with all this, I, must, I don't have a drinking problem, believe me. <laughs> um, I, which are comparable to third world countries. Unemployment, poor water, oh. adequate housing, you know. Poor health and education services, high costs of food and amenities, drug and alcohol, addiction, despair leading to suicides, a welfare system that is difficult to escape, and a justice system that the Supreme Court of Canada, on two occasions, one when I was there, has described as failing with respect to First Peoples. So the list of serious ailments is huge, simply put, we, we as Canadians cannot hold our heads high internationally or morally intact while these conditions persist. That's the simple fact. So before outlining some thoughts on a new relationship, I wish to look briefly at the past. It's going to be brief, but the, and then go to the present and offer some comments on the future. I've always been guided by that past, present, and future because of Petrarch. Uh, I'm of Italian background, so I like Petrarco. Um, he always said of the ancient city, where did it come from, where is it now, and where is it going? And that's what I think we can apply to this that topic. The past is not a happy one just looking at selective examples. When contact by European settler nations took place, it was often violent and tragic. Treaties that resulted were basically peace treaties and were not universal throughout Canada. They were expressed in sparse and general wording, raised language issues and misunderstanding, and different underlying assumptions. At the risk of oversimplification, let me just say that in, from the indigenous people perspective, the treaty meant the sharing of the land and resources, whereas the non-Aboriginal view was based on the acquisition of land and resources in exchange for some consideration, which in many cases was wholly inadequate. Reflecting a policy of forced assimilation and racial superiority, the Indian residential schools, about which we've heard a lot and about which people here have experienced either directly or indirectly through subsequent generations. It was set up, those schools set up in the 19th century. The policy uh, was a federal one, but the 130 or so schools were operated by the major Christian denominations. We all know taking the children away for periods of up to 12 years 
with little contact with families in most cases. Attendance was compulsory and gruesome justifications, which you've heard. Gruesome justifications, such as beat the Indianness of the, out of the child and elevate the Indian, Indian from a state of savagery. The ch children were treated humanely, inhumanely, often given numbers, not names, and so on, and their hair cut short, forbidden to speak their native language or practice their traditions. And, of course, many were brutalized, both either physically or sexually. And at least 3,200 deaths were recorded through burial records, although burial records, burial records are scant, and the actual total is, is probably higher. I've gone into the IRS legacy because it is, one of the, I think, one of the most significant examples of our history that has alienated indigenous people in our country, and I don't see why that shouldn't have been the case. But it doesn't, that policy doesn't stand alone. We had a, a, a policy of insulting condescension that was reflected in the wardship system. The first peoples were restricted to reserves with no right to vote and needed permission of the Indian agent to leave the reserve. When you see these signed uh, approvals of the Indian agent, it, when I first read them, it put a chill up through my body. Why would someone have to get permission from somebody to leave? I just, I just couldn't comprehend it. And then we had successive amendments to the Indian Act that have raised and continue to raise controversial issues of lack of independence, freedom, and respect. And alongside these developments are abundant examples of racial discrimination in virtually all spheres of human intervention and interaction. Education, the administration of justice that I mentioned, employment, and so on. To emphasize the importance of history generally, and in particular the selective examples I've mentioned, we should recall, although there are written languages. I mean, I, I did a report on lack of jury representation in Ontario's juries for criminal trials uh, um, and coroner's inquests of, 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 of First Nations. And though that report, to my knowledge, it was intended to be published in uh, indigenous languages. Cree, uh, uh, Ojibwe, Oji Cree, M Mohawk, uh, but it was too complicated because it was legal stuff, and and it wouldn't. But the executive assembly was, and then it was. But that was my knowledge at the first time something like that was recognizing uh, indigenous languages. But my point here was, in, when you read, there are uh, written aspects to the culture. But a lot of the culture of indigenous for, uh, people are, is oral. And when the, when the, if you like, mistreatment of history is passed from generation to generation orally, it, to me, it, it takes on an extra emphasis in that retelling of the story and retelling of the story from one generation to the next. It, 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 to me, it adds a, 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 a more of a, of a, 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 a a, 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 a tragic and, uh, and, and very, very harsh uh, attitudes on behalf of the, those that were responsible for the mistreatment. Now, this is not to say that the Canada has not spent billions of dollars on Aboriginal programs and support, both federally and provincially, nor to ignore the fact that Canada is the only country that I am aware of that has specific provisions in its constitution dealing with First Peoples. And that sec section 35 on the affirming of Aboriginal and quoting from the, stat the constitution of Aboriginal and treaty rights has been, has created the jurisprudence of cases 
uh, and which continues to evolve. But I don't know of any other country that has that. New Zealand has the Treaty of Otangi, but it, it is not, a, it's sort of quasi-constitutional. But let me just say this in reply. Yes, constitutional laws are important. Yes, laws are important. But laws, whether constitutional or otherwise, are necessary, but they're not sufficient. You have, we, have, we have to go beyond that. One of the best constitutions I have ever seen was the one of the Soviet Union. Unbelievable, and I, I don't read Russian, so it was a translation. But even in the translation, it was, it was artful, beautiful, inspiring. But would you say the law reflected the reality in, in that country? No. no. Don't take my word for it. When I was a judge, we had a visit from the president of the Constitutional Court of the Soviet Union and some of his colleagues from the court. They were coming to Canada because they wanted to know about the independence of the judiciary. They wanted to know, do you get a phone call from the Minister of Justice, from the President of the Communist Party or his counterpart in Canada, saying, comrade, we understand your, your decision is coming out on this case. You know how important this is to the party. This is, this is the words of the President of the Constitutional Court of the Soviet Union. So yes, laws are nice and important, and they can be very effective, and we need them, but we have to have something more than that. So let me go to the present, having looked briefly at the past, and time prevents me again from giving the present situation uh, the, the attention it deserves. So I've been quite selective. But in looking at where we are now, it's fair to say that a number of factors have contributed to what can be called a somewhat, somewhat improved state of affairs regarding indigenous people. Some examples. Well, I think the charter provisions in 81 and 82 and the original amend uh, the uh, indigenous people amendments made so much sense from the standpoint of equality and recognition of our first peoples, which were underlying forces that led to that result. When I was Deputy Minister of Justice, I worked on some unfinished business coming from the patriation and the charter introduction of 81-82. And that unfinished business dealt with an amendment to the Constitution on self-government for first uh, peoples. And Scott is searching, is nodding his head because he, he worked on that. Now, the attempt to put in a constitutional amendment in self-government failed. But what I, th for self, for uh, First Nations, it failed narrowly. But what has happened since is de facto, we'll get, we see, first, uh, we see uh, government, self-government. We see more of it. Um, you, you can me visit many communities and see tangible evidence of this. So, it's interesting to see, and I, I would pr obviously predict that more of that will come uh, under a new attitude. But the present is also, uh, there are some examples of it. So, and I, I will say, I think the courts of our country, uh, through a jurisprudence, have, has created more opportunities to address, to address uh, the uh, indigenous relationship in a respectful and progressive manner. Coming up with, for example, the duty to consult and if appropriate accommodate indigenous people's rights and interests in circumstances where they are affected. And uh, I, I can say this with some pride that I was privileged to be on the bench for some of those cases that led to greater recognition by Canadian institutions and the public of the situation facing our First Peoples. And without overstating the matter, through the efforts of Aboriginal leadership and government action, 
But more importantly, most importantly, the survivors, the survivors of Indian residential schools. That litigation, which consisted of over 20 class actions, some 15,000 to 18,000 individual actions, were settled by the agreement that has been referred to. Uh, that was started, the process was started by former Prime Minister Paul Martin, who in my view doesn't get the credit he deserves for this. And then it was, it was it concluded under Prime Minister Harper. That settlement, which was the largest settlement and still is, I gather, in legal history, that to me doesn't make it noteworthy. What really makes it noteworthy, noteworthy is that it was a way of Canada trying to do something that was fair and honorable toward that part of our history. And I don't mean to imply that the settlement suddenly erased the IRS and its consequences uh, from uh, history. But it, it does represent, along with the apologies, a, a, an admission of serious wrongdoing and a request for forgiveness. And those are positive developments. And I recently attended the ceremony, I attended the ceremony of the House of Commons for the apology, but I also attended two weeks ago the ceremony in the legislature of Ontario where Premier Wynne offered her apology. And uh, that was, um, I have to say, also moving and, and, and most sincerely and I think genuinely delivered. And I was, so I was proud on those two occasions to be a Canadian, to see those, those apologies delivered in that way, not to mention the apologies of the churches and so on. But the most important part of the settlement to me was not the compensation, that was significant, but it was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And uh, the, that was absolutely centrally important in many ways. That's why we're here, uh, to follow up on the most important part of the issue facing our country, namely reconciliation. And I'm delighted to hear that the National Center is being established in, in, in Winnipeg. And I can't say enough about the report that the uh, commissioners put together. I said on another occasion that for those of us involved in the negotiation, and I, I see a couple of lawyers here, uh, David Patterson is here, uh, uh, that report from the, from the perspective of those who were negotiating the settlement was m m way uh, up to the expectations that all of us had. And, uh, the commissioners are to be uh, profoundly uh, congratulated for what they've done. Their calls to action uh, are clear uh, in, the, in their purpose to achieve reconciliation, uh, uh, which I think is already uh, being uh, uh, not only just considered, but, but being implemented, and this is this dialogue at this colloquium, this conference is, is part of that. The, I just want to spend a little time on what the uh, commission uh, in its final report said when calling on the federal and provincial governments to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This declaration was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007, sets out a statement from the international community on the manner in which international human rights law should apply to indigenous people. Um, some of you have met James uh, Anaya, the first special rapporteur. Uh, I, I met him, a most impressive individual, uh, just met him the week he was announced as dean of the University of Colorado, in fact, dean of law at the University of Colorado. Among other things, the declaration addresses circumstances in which a state 
st states must consult indigenous peoples when their rights or interests, interests are potentially affected by a proposed measure with the aim of obtaining their free, prior, and informed consent and circumstances in which states must refrain from action if that consent is not obtained. Now, these international legal principles just shows you how there is an international dimension to what we think about as reconciliation within Canada. I believe that these uh, free, informed, prior, free, prior, and informed consent um, is, can, can be set alongside Canadian domestic law on consult and accommodate where appropriate. But because the, they have the same purpose, and that is to protect Aboriginal peoples' underlying rights to remedy the significant historical advantage and disenfranchisement of Indigenous peoples that they have faced, and to provide the foundations for a more dignified, ongoing relationship that recognizes, reconciles First Peoples' self government and other rights with non First People. Uh, and governments of Canada. So both sets of principles are intended to provide a foundation for a more responsible activity in which Indigenous people are able to, part to participate and indeed from which they can benefit. And although Canada initially objected to the adoption of the new and declaration, we all know and happily was happy to see on May 9th, Canada announced that it formally of this year it formally removed its permanent objector status and confirmed plans to fully adopt and implement uh, the, uh, the declaration. And Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs, Carolyn Bennett, stated, and I quote, adopting and implementing the declaration means that we will be breathing life, we will be breathing life into Section 35 of Canada's Constitution, which provides a full box of rights for Indigenous peoples. So, uh, those in the present, those things are really important uh, uh, events. Um, and on a more individual basis, um, you, you know that there have been many uh, uh, transactions, many uh, initiatives that involve mediators and facilitators for uh, f First Peoples and dealings with provincial governments and private companies. Uh, this to me, he has shown a greater willingness, not only on the part of a government, but also on the part of the private sector to take uh, indigenous rights seriously. And that is in important to note. This, in my lifetime, is quite a change from the past. A more direct example, as I said, I did this a, a report for the Attorney General of Ontario on lack of first representation on juries, First Nations representation on juries for a coroner's inquest in criminal trials. And I'm delighted to see that an implementation committee was struck that had two co-chairs, one First Nation and one government representative. And the, and the majority of the implementation advisory committee were from First Nation representatives. This just was, again, unheard of. And I don't want to make, say, oh, this means we've, we've reached the promised land. We haven't meet, met and gone to the promised land. But it's important to take note of these in encouraging the momentum that that can represent. And that's my point. And then I end with this. Uh, comment. The most important point I wish to make about all of this is the following, it, and that is, I, I have been, in, 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 over the last number of decades, impressed by the leadership of the First Peoples in these initiatives. The articulate, intelligent, committed leaders, but alongside that leadership, there's also been greater engagement with the communities that they come from by their leaders. And that communication and engagement uh, 
doesn't mean that reaching agreement is made easier or faster, but it does reveal that that's the right way to go. Because we need to get to the people who live in those communities. And, it's, and I'm not saying the leaders don't represent that view, but the importance of that communication also is a lesson to those from the non-Aboriginal side to learn more about those communities by that need for the engagement that has taken place. And uh, that brings me now to the future. And in making some observations about a way forward, I start with the point that I do not wish to ignore uh, probably the number one issue, and that's the poverty situation in so many communities. I just can't ignore that. And so what I'm talking about going forward, I, I don't want to be taken for saying that I'm insensitive to that important factor, but lack of equal opportunities for education and healthcare resources and job opportunities and careers and training and drinkable water, adequate housing. These are first order needs and they have to be addressed. The way forward, reflected by my suggestions, is intended to be both a goal in itself and a means to confront conditions facing First Peoples, all through forging a new relationship. The domestic duty to consult and accommodate in the international principles of free, prior, and informed consent, of course, form part of the framework governing this new relationship. However, the relationship should not solely or even principally be a government having minimum duties that apply legally. And that's, as I say, that is, is, is a threshold. But in approaching this new relationship, I also want to underscore the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation 94 calls to action that have to be taken into account and considered extremely carefully. In my view, the new relationship must include a number of components that will be supported by the First Nations, uh, the First Peoples, and the Canadians generally. And these components should include just the following. They're very simple, they're very straightforward. You, you would have heard them in other contexts, I'm sure, but they are what I feel from my background and from my experience. One, all of us should not forget the history that surrounds the treatment of Aboriginal people and First Nations people and Indigenous people collectively. We need to know and understand and educate ourselves about that. But we need not dwell on it to prevent progress, but rather to let that history of First People treatment serve as an incentive to move forward honorably and fairly. Two, the relationship must, must be principle-based and not be short-term. Too much of government action, private sector involvement, was transactional and not building a relationship. Ours has to be on mutually agreed principles and for the long term so that we can live harmoniously together. Three, a new relationship will require a change in attitudes, both for First Peoples and for non-First Peoples, which will in turn require a commitment and effort to achieve. There's a lot uh, that we have to uh, change in how we react to First Peoples. Education 
at all levels can be a great aid in that respect. And I don't mean education just at the post-secondary level in the schools, right from uh, elementary school up. What people fail to mention about education, in my view, is that when children are educated, they can have a great effect on educating their parents. I think there's a, a, a Jewish saying that the parent teaches the child. But sometimes the child teaches the parent. I can point to some views that my children had that helped me understand better certain issues that I had to decide as a judge. And we can all say that, I think, about, about somehow l learning from our children. And if they're being educated about this, maybe the parents weren't educated about it. But they may help in educating their parents. So education is, is important at the beginning levels and through. A new relationship must be founded on mutual respect and mutual trust. And you can't just proclaim there will be mutual respect and mutual trust. It has to be is earned by conduct. And mutual respect is the first. Because you can't have trust without respect. But it has to be done by conduct, by action, by policies that reflect that respect and build, hopefully, that mutual trust. And of course, the fifth, the government to government relationship with each community. But that recognition of that government to government relationship is not a recognition by provincial and federal governments, but it's gotta be by the people and institutions of Canada as well as the governments, because then it will be imperfect if it isn't, and it's of fundamental importance. My last point is, again, simple, and you hear the word used a lot, but I think if you pay attention to it profoundly, it's really important, and it is reflected in this organization, Canadians for a New Partnership, and it is a partnership. Partnership between First Nations people and and on First Nations people, and First Peoples, acting through their respective governments. And a partnership, by definition, cannot exist if there isn't mutual respect and mutual trust. It just can't. It, 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 it defies partnership. And the importance, to me, of partnership is to, is it transform, it avoids an adversarial relationship compared to a, having a collaborative and sharing relationship. Partnership means working together. Partnership means sharing. Partnership means aiming for progress together. And we see some of the modern treaties, the Nishka Treaty, the James Bay Treaty, having some, I think, aspects of what I'm talking about. So to come to an end, we need special efforts to be made to support education and training for First Peoples, but not overlook education for Canadians generally about First Peoples. And we can't let that education be the victims of federalism disputes. No, it's federal, no, it's provincial. Um, it would be wonderful to see our relationship with First Peoples be a joint federal provincial project. Joint, not just federal, 
not just provincial, but joint, say this is going to be the best example of cooperative federalism, tackling the relationship with our First Peoples. That, to me, is so sensible. But maybe it, because it's so sensible, it's, it's not easy to achieve. And there are many groups that are involved in all of this, too numerous to mention. I don't, I, I can't get over how there's been a, a, a more of a time for more Canadians, more first peoples who are talking, dialogue, having the dialogue uh, that is going on and it harbors well for the future. We can't overlook economic participation and sharing in resource and commercial development. Uh, they are essential to have First Peoples rightfully and appropriately participating and sharing in prosperity and economic well-being. Now I just want to say, by way of ending, that what I'm calling for and others are calling for is going to be costly. No doubt. But I believe the costs are even greater if we don't do something along the lines I've talked about. Thanks very much.